back in the control room. I think this is the afternoon now there on the side of your screen. You're seeing the red beam, which is the second beam that they launched at, uh, I think, about just after 2 o'clock in the afternoon. And it made its slow progress around the enormous LHC. Roger Bailey there telling us from time to time what was going on. The beam made a controlled journey around the LHC, being stopped at various stages so that the engineers and the scientists and the technicians in the control center to, could control the beam better and reduce the oscillations and just improve the quality of it all in all. That was the first sector successfully <laughs> achieved in the counterclockwise direction. First injection in that direction. And this is the almost full circle done in the counterclockwise direction with just the last little bit missing from point one to point eight. It's the double and flashes we're looking for again. There it is, the completion of the circle. What a day. Not one beam, but two successfully sent around the LHC. So both channels, both acceleration channels were successfully navigated. No wonder they're feeling satisfied. And this okay, is the Director well, General so congratulating Giorgio Brianti, one of the first project leaders of the LHC 25 years ago, <laughs> who said he was very happy to have lived long enough to see this. You can hear the popping of champagne corks. It was at 4.30 this afternoon that the celebrations really began in earnest because that's when the alcohol ba ban here at CERN is lifted and the partying started. But that doesn't mean that the work has stopped because some technicians, some engineers, some scientists remain on shift and they're going to continue working through the night to make sure that the next step will be a circulating no, beam. No, this uh, su successful day of, spectacular successful day of the start of the LHC uh, uh, machine operations. Uh, I would also like to give some This is Jos Engelen at 5.30 for the, 5 for the final briefing of the day. And uh, even if uh, they haven't seen beam-beam collisions yet, they will very soon. Uh, they have been in a position to register the particles that were sent to them by the LHC, not cosmic rays this time, by the LHC, uh, at the time uh, that they needed to register them. So they were able to time in their detectors and make an enormous progress from well-prepared detectors to detectors that are really seeing what they should be seeing. So also there, at that front, uh, the LHC program today has really started and we can look back also uh, in that respect at a very, very successful day. Again, the images replayed of the completion of the full circle in both directions. And we got not only one, but we got both beams. Now, I, I think I, I just come from a meeting where we, uh, we have discussed the program now for, for, the, uh, for the next 24 hours. We will be up continuing to work through the night and through the day tomorrow, which is an of official holiday in CERN. And uh, we will be going full speed at uh, getting this machine up to the energy, the 10 TV in the center of mass, and getting collisions for the start of the scientific program as soon as possible. Insignificant though this bottle of compressed hydrogen gas looks, it marks the beginning of the world's largest and most powerful particle accelerator chain, culminating in CERN's spectacular Large Hadron Collider. Hydrogen atoms from this gas cylinder are fed at a precisely controlled rate into the source chamber of a linear accelerator, CERN's LINAC-2, where their electrons are stripped off to leave hydrogen nuclei. These are protons and have a positive charge, enabling them to be accelerated by an electric field. 
their journey to eventually take part in ultra high energy collisions similar to those following the Big Bang can now begin. This initial acceleration has caused Linux 2 to be likened to the lumbering first stage of a huge rocket. By the time this packet of protons leaves Linux 2, it'll be travelling at one third the speed of light. It's about to enter the booster, stage 2 of the rocket if you will. In order to maximise the intensity of the beam, the packet is divided up into four, one for each of the booster's rings. Straight acceleration is now impractical and the booster is circular, 157 metres in circumference. In order to accelerate the packets they are repeatedly circulated and the electric field is now pulsed in the same way that you push a child on a swing each time they reach a certain point. Magnets exert a force on the passing protons at right angles to their direction of motion and so powerful electromagnets are used to bend the beam of protons round the circle. The booster accelerates the protons up to 91.6% of the speed of light and squeezes them closer together. Recombining the packet from the four rings, it's then flung on into the proton synchrotron, by analogy stage 3 of our rocket. Let's just follow two such proton packets. The proton synchrotron is 628 metres in circumference and they circulate for 1.2 seconds, reaching over 99.9% .9 of the velocity of light. It's here that the point of transition is reached, a point where the energy added to the protons by the pulsating electric field cannot translate into increased velocity as they're already approaching the limiting speed of light. Instead, the added energy manifests itself as increasing mass of the protons. In short, the protons can't go faster, so they get heavier. The microscopic kinetic energy of each proton is measured in units called electron volts, and now the energy of each proton has risen to 25 giga electron volts, or JEV. The protons are now 25 times heavier than they are at rest. The packets of protons are now channeled into stage 4, the superproton synchrotron, a huge ring 7 kilometres in circumference, designed specifically to accept protons at this energy and increase it to 450 jev. Soon, the packets of protons will be energised sufficiently to be launched into the orbit of the gigantic Large Hadron Collider, or LHC which lies between the Jura Mountains and the Alps and straddles both France and Switzerland. Lying deep underground, it has a circumference of 27 kilometres. There are two vacuum pipes within the LHC containing proton beams travelling in opposite directions. Using ultra-sophisticated kickers to synchronise incoming packets with those already circulating, one vacuum pipe has injected into it protons which will circulate clockwise and the other protons which will circulate anti-clockwise. The counter-rotating beams cross over in the four detector caverns where they can be made to collide. The energy of the collision is double that of the individual opposing protons and it's the debris from these collisions that is tracked in the detectors. For half an hour the SPS injects protons Finally, there are 2,808 packets. During this time, the LHC adds extra energy to each proton, whose velocity is now so near the speed of light that it goes round the 27 km ring over 11,000 times each second, getting a boost of energy at each revolution from the pulsed electric field. Finally, each proton has an energy of 7 tera electron volts and they're 7,000 times heavier than at rest. The magnetic force needed to keep the beams bending to the ring is so enormous that nearly 12,000 amps must flow through its electromagnets. This is achieved by making the LHC colder than outer space so that its magnets become superconducting. Now the protons are ready to collide in the detectors. A steering magnet finally brings them onto a collision course.
The total energy of two protons colliding in the LHC is 14 tera electron volts and reproduces similar states to moments after the Big Bang. Particle tracks from these collisions will be analysed by computers connected to the detectors and it's hoped these tracks will give a new insight into the very birth of our universe. How our universe has evolved, what governs its behaviour today and where it's going in the future.